So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this closing panel, where the aim is to focus on the links between research and policy and lessons from this conference. A special and very warm welcome uh, to the members of our panel, uh, who include President Tarja Hallonen, the 11th President of the Republic of Finland. President Hallonen was Finland's first female head of state, serving two terms from 2000 to 2012. And President Hallonen has also played an active and much appreciated international role in many committees and boards advocating human rights, equality, and sustainable development. Welcome, President Hallonen. We appreciate your presence. <laughs> Mr. Suel Katu Nesitense, who has a long history in the government of South Africa. And currently, he is the executive director of the Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflection, MISTRA. He is a member of the ANC National Executive Committee and is a member of the boards of NetBank Group and the advisory board of the Nelson Mandela Trust. Welcome, Joel. <laughs> Dr. Annika Sundin, the chief economist of the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, CEDA, prior to joining the civil service and associate director for research at the Center for Retirement Research and an economist at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. Her interests in research include the economics of retirement, pensions, and Social Security, as well as household savings behavior. Annika, welcome. And last, James E. Foster, Professor of Economics and International Affairs at the George Washington University and Director of the Institute for International Economic Policy in the Elliott School of International Affairs. His research focuses on welfare economics, using economic tools to evaluate and enhance the well-being of people. Welcome, James. When we were originally planning uh, this final plenary, uh, we invited the president of the Korean International Cooperation Agency, Koike, uh, to help kick us off. Young Mok Kim, however, could not be with us uh, here today, but here is what he wishes to convey uh, to us all. So there is a video now which will be shown. Good afternoon, everyone. How is the conference? I regret that I'm speaking only to you from Korea. Missing good discussions, nice hospitality, and late summer weather of Helsinki. I miss you all. Dear Dr. Finn Tam, distinguished guests and friends, let me first congratulate you on the successful hosting of this important conference and thank all the speakers and distinguished guests for their contributions. You have selected the right subject at the right time. I should also commend the academic contributions of UN wider on the broad topics of poverty, inequality, and growth, which have resulted in the World Inequality Database. Today, wider has expanded its scope to measurement, trends, impact, and policies of inequality, which I believe are instrumental to upgrade our common efforts to reduce inequality on a global level. I'm honored and happy to speak to you in this rare but timely opportunity, which will serve as a valuable platform for every one of us. Distinguished guests, these days inequality has emerged as a major agenda worldwide. A popularity of capital in the first 21st century by Thomas Piketty indicates that the public discontent caused by rising inequality should have been felt by many throughout the world. A number of prominent economists joined the debate on what Piketty raised. While Piketty and other prominent Western economists have focused analysis on major domestic economies, there still remains the question 
of how inequality pertains to the context of global development, particularly in relation to eradicating poverty and sustaining growth in developing countries. Even though inequality has sharply risen in individual countries, the global landscape of inequality has been improved over the past few decades. Inequality between rich and poorer nations has been narrowed thanks to the economic surges of many countries like China, India, and Brazil. It would be fair to note that globalization in trade, investment, technology, and human resources contributed to this balance. With that being said, it is also true that the concentration of income and wealth within the top 10% has surprisingly increased. In 2010, an estimated 18% of the world's wealth belonged to the top 1% compared to 1980 when it was only 8%. Many studies have warned that rising inequality, as observed in many emerging economies, can seriously undermine social stability and ultimately impede sustainable growth. The recent OEC report, Policy Challenges for the Next 50 Years, states that sustaining growth while addressing rising inequality will be the major policy challenge for every country. Therefore, reducing inequality must be dealt in close association with the eradication of poverty. Although the population living on $1.25 per day has reduced by half in the last two decades, the population living on $2 per day has only been reduced by a mere 7% to 2.4 billion. Despite the growth and development of middle-income countries, 70% of world's population living under extreme poverty still exist in these countries. Now, as we enter in the post-2015 era, we need to take up the issue of inequality at the top of our agenda. Share the prosperity, which the World Bank Group has set as its new goal, is not achievable if we are not able to include those people at the large bottom in the process of growth. From the perspective of the world development community, including me, the proportion of inequality may matter less than inclusion of the people left behind. In most developing economies, inequality does not stop at income. High inequality exists in terms of access to the most critical services and public goods, such as water, proper sanitation, basic health care, adequate education, running electricity, online information, and protection from natural disaster, etc. There are also inequalities in civil rights and good governance along with effective institutions. Inequality will become much more acceptable, I believe, when the bottom is lifted over and given better opportunities and equal access to these public goods. Today, we witness more than 33 million people who are being forcibly displaced from their homes due to war conflict and terrorism. War destroys the case of achievement. It is not too difficult to imagine the lives of people living under extreme poverty or the plight of displacement. Frustration and desperation can make these people feel isolated and abandoned. Thus, it poses a dangerous threat to the sense of ownership that serves as the base for inclusion-based growth. From the Korean experience, transforming desperation into hope was the key to inclusion. Without the self-motivation of the people, the will to rise up from poverty and desire for inclusion, smart policy and investment will have little effect.
Therefore, our role is not only deliver services, but rather empower the people. Then it is equally important for individual governments to take the inclusion based by empowerment as a national development policy to create larger impact on a national level. For this task, we began to find out the broad coalition or wider coalition among public, public sectors is required. That coalition or inclusive wider partnership will be able to organize tangible, non-tangible assets by coordination of government, but mostly activated by the people having ownership. Activation of a critical mass among the people would be the first step to lift up the people at the bottom to the level of a value chain. I hope we'll be able to make the right strategy enabling us to make the most of all assets available. In this context, impact measurement and data will be crucial. I'm confident that extensive discussion at this conference and beyond will create the base from which future actions will be taken. Wider participation is needed. Please continue to enjoy your gathering. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The format will now be that I try, to the best of my ability, to ask some motivating questions to our panel and then subsequently we'll have a free-flowing interaction between the panel and the floor. So I would ask that we try to not sort of have presentations of half an hour. Um, it would be good to have this free-flowing interaction. President Hallinan, you've been an active champion of the Nordic social and economic model which tries to combine an efficient market economy with an egalitarian distribution of both income and other dimensions of welfare. Could, could, could you try to sort of elaborate what policies and initiatives have, in your view, been really of key importance to get this Nordic model to work? And, and, and to what extent could other countries which do not have similar income levels state capacity and maybe social cohesion learn from that experience. I'm not talking about copying, but is there something there which should be kicked into our debates? Uh, anybody, anybody here from Guatemala? No. So um, once years ago I was in Guatemala at the university and uh, so I, I, I had an opportunity to tell about the Nordic welfare model. And uh, then I underlined both uh, the, uh, how, to, how to create uh, incomes for the society and then how to have a fair share of this, uh, this property. And then one of the young gentlemen took a took on four and said to me that, uh, yes, madam, but we are much poorer, and, and uh, we do that when we are rich, but we cannot do it now. And I answered to him quite roughly, I said, you will never be rich if you don't do it now. And I think that this is the first lesson, that uh, all European countries, or almost all, we have been once very poor. Finland has been um, 700 years uh, a part of Sweden, nicely said, uh, under the Swedish kings and queens. Uh, then Swedish king lost the war against the Russia, and, and then they gave us to Russia. And then we were 100 years under the Russian Tsar, and then just uh, we had a good, good ice hole, good timing. And so when the Red Revolution started in, in, in St. Petersburg, so we declared ourselves independent. And Yes, it succeeded. But afterwards, we have one, one civil war immediately and then two other wars because Mr. Stalin was not as friendly as, as we could hope. But, um, but then still we have a Nordic model. We were the last and the poorest to do it. So with Sweden, for instance, I, I'm sure 
we have also, not only here, but there also somebody from Sweden. Sweden has been one of the center powers like Denmark in the north. So you can say that they, they have been never imperialist in that way, that they could get a lot of resources from somewhere else. But in some way, they had a stronger position than what Norway, Iceland, and Finland had. So, but it has been possible to create also in poor circumstances. And so I think that um, I don't know really why we, we have had it here in the north, but I think that one reason is perhaps that uh, this uh, nature, it's hard, be, hard to believe when you see now our late summer, but this, this is pretty hard. And, and so, uh, so you don't survive over the winter if you don't work very, very hard. Really, it's a struggle, in old days especially. And even if you do all, all, all the things what you could be expected and even more, so it can be so that you have a failure. And then we learn that then we help each other. So I think that one of this is, is the hardship by the nature, which was not too hard. I mean, we could survive. And then we learn also to see the future and to save and to help <coughs> each other, to be more not only individual. Individuals had to work very hard but also so that you have a collective feeling that you can survive. So I think that that has been perhaps the base. Then we have had a very good luck during the history. For instance, um, uh, first we got, we didn't wish it, but we got the Christianity from the West and, and East. Um, it was a Catholic religion, but then uh, the Swedish king decided to become a Lutheran. And, and uh, then uh, with Martin Luther, the German German uh, Christian philosopher, so, so we learn that you have to be able to read yourself Bible, yes. which means that then you have to read and write. And uh, I think that the Finnish church found one of the best bonus for the young ones. They say that they don't bless officially their marriages if you, you cannot read and write. I hope that they could find as good bonuses today. And so it, we have created very early the tradition that the good citizen will uh, be able to read and write. In some other societies, it's not considered so important. <clears throat> and education has been, through the history, one of the ideas. We are not so noble, but as I said, we, we had not too much natural resources, so we had to invest in people, and um, so we have succeeded that. And now, later on, I think that the independence struggle um, in the uh, in the early years of the last century, uh, it united people, and it's just the right time so that also the emancipation was a good one. And so the women and men gave their rights to vote and, and to be elected at the same time. And I think that this, the collectivity, the hard working, and, and then uh, education, um, it has been one of the basic elements. But uh, of course the social welfare has been also important. Um, and uh, then the last one, what I nowadays repeat every page, and I think you have heard it also during this week, is the taxation. You don't get it just like that. You have to have also resources, and then um, in all countries at all economical level, you have to find a way how to make even a minimum, but certain fair way to collect resources to the society. So um, that's, I would say, um, is, is good. And the last one is that the system where you say that it's a system of the nature that winner takes all doesn't fit to the sustainable development. Even we need strong personalities, we need a lot of the collective feeling, and I think that that perhaps the message we can give also the others. How you do it in your own society? I don't know. You know best your own society. And, and so, um, uh, Try hard and have a lot of sense of humor because uh, <laughs> during the years you will hear many times that how terrible you are, how stupid you are, how, how your ideas are just next to nothing and so on. But then if you know and you have experience and you have friends in the, in the international uh, associations, society, so you can, you can tell that no, this has worked there and there and they are not smarter than us, so it could perhaps also work with us. Okay, thanks. Thank you, President. Shuel, you're in charge of an institute of strategic reflection in South Africa, a country that has been marked by high inequality. 
And if, if I may add a, a personal sort of note to that, I mean, when I was emerging out um, of the 1980s and had sort of established my so-called underground credentials in relation to the South African struggle, we did engage on lots of policy analysis in South Africa. And then by around 1994, 95, I, I kind of gave up a little bit, uh, sort of frustrated as an academic. So I, I, I'm sort of, I mean, I'm burning to ask you the following question. Why is it so hard to reduce inequality in South Africa? And, 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 and what do you take from this conference when you travel home? Is there anything that you kind of felt this gave you something which you might want to think about? So is there something in that combination of your experience, your in-depth background of this process over these past 20, 25 years and then, what, were there any clues here at this conference? Sure. No, the, thank you very much. Perhaps just to set the scene uh, to the question that you have posed, in the analysis that we have done about the socio-economic progress that South Africa has made since uh, 1994, a few stark figures stand out. The first one being that income poverty has declined. Secondly, the functional distribution of income has not declined, which means inequality has, has, has increased. Also, interestingly, um, the change in the share of income has not favored the middle class. And so you find that uh, the per capita expenditure growth incidence curve, it's U-shaped. Poor rest of the poor have benefited from social grants and other programs of that kind. The richest have also benefited, but the, the, the curve is, is U-shaped. Uh, the third and perhaps most important observation is that uh, inequality between the races has declined somewhat, but inequality within the races, even amongst the black community, has widened. So as you are reducing inequality in society, uh, even within the black community, there are those who are benefiting much, much more than the, the rest of society. And so the issue arises, as, as you have posed the question, has there been sufficient emphasis on dealing with inequality in South Africa's policy since 1994? The first, first point that needs to be made in that regard is that there has been seriousness in dealing with poverty. There has been seriousness in trying to deal with challenges of social exclusion. Uh, and I decided to do a very rough exercise specifically on the issue of inequality. And what I established is that in the document that was developed by the ANC, African National Congress, which is the ruling party, just before 1994, a document that was defining how it will uh, change the, the, the apartheid system, the word inequality there appeared... I think only three times in a very long document dealing with transformation of the apartheid system. Then after that was the white paper on reconstruction and development. Immediately after the ANC came into government, the word inequality there appears only five times. But interestingly, in the review that was done in uh, 2009 on the performance of, of a government, the word inequality appears 41 times. And in one that was done a few months ago, it appears 43 times. What does that mean? What it means is that there is now a better appreciation that whilst you might have dealt with poverty, you have not resolved the challenges of inequality. And that income inequality is in fact inimical to social cohesion. 
it's inimical to stability within society. But the question then needs to be posed. Does it mean that that ANC government was not interested in uh, dealing with inequality? And the answer is no. My own assessment is that uh, the assumption was that the post-apartheid dividend where you dealt with generic challenges of exclusion through generic socio-economic policies would help address inequality as such. That, that was the first assumption. The second assumption, which is not much different from what has happened in Southeast Asia, was that if you had very high rates of economic growth, the wave would lift all the boats. Yeah. Even if the pace at which the boats are rising might not be the same, it will not matter as long as the rate of growth is high enough. But we have now come to appreciate, for instance, that uh, even during the years of high growth, between 2003 and 2008, when the economy was growing at about 5%, in fact, inequality worsened because the rich were better able to take advantage of the growth, the economic growth, than the poor. And so currently you have discourse in the country about the kind of measures that need to be introduced specifically to address the challenge of inequality. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have sufficient time, but I can just list a few of them. The first one is about whether you do not need to introduce a national minimum wage. Secondly, whether you do not need to introduce a national incomes policy that would deal with differentials within companies and enterprises and within society as a whole. Then there is the issue about uh, addressing the cost of living as it affects the poor. Just to give you an example, uh, employers in South Africa complain that the cost of labor is too high. But in reality, we have been saying to them, if you compare the wage that a South African worker gets and that uh, the wage of, say, a Chinese worker who produces the same goods, what you will discover is that the Chinese worker stays in a compound and walks to work. But because of apartheid in South Africa and the spatial patterns arising out of that, the South African worker spends 40% of their wages on, on transport. So the interventions that are required need to deal with that cost of living as it impacts on, on the poor. The last issue that is under discussion is whether you do not need to think about such measures as uh, employee share ownership programs, profit sharing, and so on, so that you ensure that uh, those miners who went on strike for some six and, 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 and more months recently feel part of the enterprise and share not only in terms of the wages but also in terms of profit sharing. So what does one take from this conference? It will be too many things to, to, to list but maybe a few observations, three of them. Uh, the firstly, one had always assumed that uh, the counterintuitive tendency that we have observed in Brazil where inequality has been reduced, when globally inequality has been increasing, applies only to Brazil. But the presentations have demonstrated that many other countries in Latin America have experienced a reduction in inequality, and therefore it would become necessary to study the reasons behind that and see whether this could be applicable not only to South Africa but to Southern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the second issue which is subject to debate is one about absorption of as many people as possible into economic activity and whether you can you can achieve that at high levels of payment or whether you would want to start off 
in a phase in which you absorb as many people as possible and then improve their, 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 their payments as time goes on. China is changing and its inequality is going down because initially they absorbed as many people as possible, but now they are climbing uh, in the manufacturing sophistication ladder. It's an issue that needs to be reflected on, an issue that is being debated with the trade union movement. And the last issue that one takes from this conference um, I think relates to perhaps insufficient discourse on the implications of inequality on the progress of countries, the relationship between inequality and social cohesion. A national development plan has been uh, developed in South Africa. It has got some targets for 2030, but for you to succeed in implementing it, you need minimum levels of social cohesion. But if there is social anomaly, if there is a sense that there is no preparedness on the part of the rich to sacrifice, then workers will not be, aid, will not be prepared to cooperate in contributing to the implementation of, of the National Development Plan. So attacking inequality becomes, should be an objective of the National Development Plan, but to some extent it's also a condition for its implementation. You have that kind of uh, cycle that you need to address. I'll stop there for now, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, may, may I add that when we are going to try to have a debate between the floor and the panel, it's also allowed for the panel members to ask questions to each other. Right. So, Annika, your chief economist of a major European or Nordic aid agency, the Swedish CEDA. What role do you see for the donor community to meet the inequality challenge in developing countries? And, and is there anything that you would sort of want to add to what President Hallinan and, and, and Shuel said? Thank you. Um, I think that uh, this conference has shown that addressing inequality is necessary to achieve sustainable and inclusive development and growth. And I think that donor agencies have an important role to play here. Um, I think the research results presented at this conference provides very important policy lessons that we in the donor community has to embrace and, and take into to, um, when we design our, our policies and, and interventions. But just going back to and commenting a bit on, on President Hallinan's remarks, I, I very much agree with the fact that, that poor countries can, can work effectively with um, combating inequality. And, and the Nordic example shows that that's possible. And, and, and like Pre President Hallinan, I, I'm not promoting that we should copy the Nordic model, but I think there are some important lessons. And, and those lessons are that it's possible to combine universal systems like social pensions, child allowances, with policies that promote employment. And, and the presentations yesterday and, and the evidence from Latin America clearly showed that labor income is crucial for, for reducing inequality. So by having a system that, that promotes employment and creates incentives for employment by providing education and, and health care, at the same time as protecting people against the risks in life, becoming sick, unemployed, but also protecting people during periods when you cannot work, when you're a child, when you're old. Uh, provides a, um, a fruitful way of, of, of reducing um, inequality. And in, in particular, and here I want to talk a little bit about the universe, universality, and I think universal systems, they may seem expensive, or you may say that we can't afford them, but I'm not so sure of that, because what a universal system can do is that it, it creates buy-in by, by including everyone. And, and by including the growing middle class, you get a willingness to pay for these systems. So that, in turn, will mobilize domestic resources. It's, po it's possible then to, to, to mobilize uh, and, and design a tax system. You, you get, people are willing to pay taxes because you get something back. So I think that's something to consider when choosing between um, a targeted system 
and a universal system. And that's something we can talk more about. Um, and I think also, I, if you look at this year's human development report, there are some interesting examples there that show this this is possible. Um, so, and in, in terms of, of, of then what can, can do, donors do, I think in terms of creating or promoting employment, there's a lot to do. And, and, but I don't think donor, the donor community can do this by themselves. Here we need to work with others. We need to work with other actors. We need to work with private industry because it's firms that create jobs, not donor agencies. Um, and in, in Sweden at CEDA, we've um, established a network with um, the private sector in Sweden to uh, work together to create or promote decent work uh, in Bangladesh, in, in several African countries where, where we we have common interests, and then those common interests can, can then help us uh, get more jobs. Mm -hmm. I think I'll stop there for now. Okay. Thank you, Annika. James, uh, you have for decades, oops, maybe I shouldn't say for two, many decades, years. two decades, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we met the first time in 1996 in Copenhagen. But what I can attest at least is that you have one of the most crisp and imaginative brains in this area. You've been a leading researcher in the topic of this conference. I mean, what do you see as the main challenges for researchers who wish to contribute to better policy in reducing inequality? And obviously, there is a very strong gender bias, gender dimension to inequality. What do you recommend researchers focus on in the years to come to help improve policy in that area? Hmm. Well, I think the first thing that I'd have to, I think everyone in the room who was at yesterday's session would agree that uh, most important for researchers is that those of you at the other end of the table help us to have the right data we need to help inform you when you have questions for us. And I think that is the main challenge that I'm seeing. I'm seeing it with the post-2015 discussion. Uh, what is this data revolution and who is going to fund it? But it needs to happen if we're going to have a successful uh, goal and um, uh, period over the next uh, two years as we decide what's going on afterwards. So data is the first answer, I would say. Secondly, be clear what form of inequality you want to reduce and why? Uh, I would take my cue from policymakers, but there are basically three forms of inequality. Vertical, that's poverty, inequality, and polarization included. Horizontal, which is inequality across salient groups in society. And polarization moves into that area as well. And finally, dimensional. Dimensional is the toughest of all because you're going into different types of spaces where you don't have the same easy access to data or perhaps easy access to the quality of data in measurement terms. Cardinal variables are easy. Ordinal or qualitative data is hard to process. But in any case, there are three forms of inequality. It's important to understand what is important at the time, right? If it's between groups, in particular ethnic groups, racial groups, then it should be focused on and analyzed. It, it should be clear ahead of time what you're getting into. I should mention that vertical inequality is actually a very simple thing. And most people don't realize how simple it is. It's basically two incomes being compared against one another. So you have one so-called income standard, a representative income, representing the entire distribution in terms of one income that's coming from the right eye. Well, right for a good reason. It represents the higher incomes. And then from the left eye, you have incomes at the lower end. And this income that represents those incomes at the lower end is compared to the other income standard. And that's how all inequality measures are constructed. The Gini, the tile, the uh, variance of logarithm, I mean, all of them have this basic fundamental structure. So following the two income standards, one of which is usually the mean, reveals 
everything that you'd want to know about both growth and inequality at the same time. So when you have abstract inequality, it can mean, well, that you have too high high or too low low. To solve inequality, you can do it in two ways. Bring down the upper income standard or bring up the lower. If I have no other connection to anything, no other inside idea of power or pressure, then I actually would rather focus on the lower end, bringing them up. Of course, there are connections and externalities that the rich are gathering the power through wealth and other things. But let's document them. Let's make sure that we know what they are and therefore decide what it means to lower the high and why we are doing it, not just for the sake of lowering it, but to know and predict what the impact and what we're trying to achieve through doing that. Poverty, by the way, is also twin income standards, but one of them happens to be a poverty line. So therefore, when you lower poverty, you're increasing the other standard among the poor people, which is unambiguously a good thing, but it's bringing them closer to the rest of society, hence inequality is likewise falling at the same time. My opinion is that inequality that is decreased across the poor and the rich is better than inequality that's decreased within the poor which is one of the critiques that Nora has had of uh, certain inequality-based poverty measures. One of the problems is what policy and how? How do you in affect inequality? Well, that's the toughest thing. We've heard some great discussions, but most often they involve other dimensions. And so we have to get into those other dimensions. It's hard to measure inequality in those other dimensions. And we have to look very carefully at how we measure inequality when we don't have the nice properties of the variables. And now I'm verging into the other question, which was, what is it that we could do in the gender area? Well, once again, the data revolution. We have to have the data. There's so much missing data on issues relevant to gender, it's incredible. We're really hemmed in by the availability of data. Now, there are great new movements forward. There's the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, which went out, gathered great data to try and find out who's empowered in the household and making agricultural decisions. And those kinds of data gathering exercises are extremely important. What to do with the data once you have them? Well, they're mostly qualitative. And so constructing quantitative data from qualitative data is exceptionally important and rather difficult. But we've seen examples of it at the conference with the multidimensional poverty measure and so forth. I really do think that the caregiving economy needs to be studied much more intensively. That's where the action is among the old. That's where the action is among the young. And it is gendered in most societies. Uh, I think that it involves a very important way of modeling the increase in capabilities in people. The, in fact, creation of capabilities takes place at an early time. And Heckman has been very emphatic in studying this part of the life cycle for its creation of capabilities. How is it done as the parent it gives it to the child? How do you model it, though? You have to bring together Heckman and Sen. It's rather difficult. But I think you guys can handle it. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thank you to the rest of the panel. <laughs> President, you wanted to? Yeah. OK. Now we are opening up. OK. Can I, when I was the first one, a little bit comment? Sure. Perhaps they too, and then you come with us. Because I think that, um, um, and of course, I would love to have a lecture, but uh, I have promised to myself that I, I will keep it brief. So You can uh, easily arrange another date. <laughs> <laughs> I think that my family at home is already now <laughs> suffering from the situation that I'm here, and we will have guests at CERN. I have tried to share the work, but anyway. So um, um, it's how you see it, because 
I think that in this country and in all Nordic countries, we have also the tendency for, the, for some recent years that they say that why we are so jealous if envy if somebody is getting richer, that it means that everybody comes little by little richer. No. It's, it's not true. It's not true. It's a certain amount, okay. But then we notice that it's one sign of what we have always thought that there is a dynamism creative dynamism in market economy, so that people want to have an entrepreneurship, they want to do things, and, and they, of course, would also to win something about that. But, but then we noticed also that even that creativity had to have the limits. It had to see that how to do it. And uh, so uh, what I have now followed with great interest is that uh, uh, whether people become more active or not active when they become richer. So everybody can tell that if you give money for the poor one, he or she will use the money for her living, and, and so it means quicker, quicker uh, economic uh, circle in that way. So it would be better to give for the more than for one. But then we come also to another, other issue, what uh, Annika, you, uh, you took already very well. What I have noticed during the 40 years I have been in politics, that uh, very easily we say we and those. <coughs> we and those in different ways, um, race, gender, whatever you, you might find. And always if you compare the welfare systems, any kind of the welfare system, it's easily you will meet every elections, which are very often um, in democratic system, that why they get everything and we have to pay it. So the universal system is best in such a way that the tax station, I love progressive tax station, but at least you have a tax station. If you want to be progressive, you do it there. And then if you give something, you give it uh, in equal terms uh, because you know that with, with tax station, you take it back. So, so it's the easiest. Otherwise, being a long time in social politics, I will say that you have a very, very difficult uh, system how you have to avoid different kind of gaps what you will get. Mm -hmm. But um, that was one thing why I wanted to comment on Annika. Then another thing is that what you mentioned about the cost of labor. I don't know any country where the cost of labor could be enough low. Wherever you go, whether it's South Africa, Germany, Finland, Russia, um, Cambodia, always somebody's complaining, oh, the, the, the it's, it's too much, the cost of labor. And I think that it's not the, that people are evil. It's a question more that, that uh, other resources in production are not priced it well, fair way. So the more we will have a limited resources by nature, the more we see that also the human labor is, is something you can, you can take. Because again, I say, if we have we <coughs> and those, those don't need so much, and we can get more. But as soon as you have to get it for the seven or eight billion people, and you have really to respect all the human rights, natural resources, sustainable development, so you have to price it a new way. And that was the best thing, one of the best things in Rio Plus 20, that we say that pricing is very important. And then in that kind of the society, consumption is no more that one, the wheel which brings, brings the economy going uh, faster and faster, but you have to see which kind of the consumption. So, so I think that um, this, is, this is it. I would love to speak more about the women, but uh, I, I hope I have more time. And then one thing what I will say to all of them, I say, one thing what I really enjoy nowadays, whether it's concerning statistics, whether it's concerning economics, whether it's concerning climate change or the seas, it's fantastic to see that what those scientists who were with the climate change started have now spread all, all about, and our slogan, release the scientist. I mean, in a way that you have to speak with everybody, not only with the political leaders and hope that you will get a strong leader, but you have to speak a different kind of the groups, because this is the only way to work in the democratic, more and more democratic world. Thank you. Thank you.
we're now going to open up. Um, Marcelo, I can see you're in a hurry. Do you have any burning question? Minister, thank you very much for your participation and have a safe flight back home. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm now going to start on this side and then I will gradually be moving to the other side. Um, I don't know whether it corresponds to my age that I start on the left and continue towards the right, but, but let me start this side. Anybody? Yes, please. And please, please identify yourself because there may be people on the panel who, who do not know you. Um, and then address the, if there is a specific question to be addressed to a specific person, please identify to whom it is. My name is uh, Andrea Brandolini from the Bank of Italy. I have two points uh, picking on what you have just said. The first one, uh, uh, James mentioned the gendered issue. I have in mind a, a very intriguing paper by Josta Esping Anderson. And in that paper, what he suggests is that uh, uh, in Nordic country, uh, there results in terms of equality in the income distribution or less inequality in the income distribution. It was not purchased per se, but was the result of uh, other policy, especially policy of uh, uh, equal opportunity for the genders. What do you think? Do you think that uh, is a fair interpretation or just uh, too speculative uh, stretching the point? And the second point is uh, I'm struck by your insistence on uh, uh, universal uh, welfare system. I totally agree with you, but it's not what international organization suggests should be uh, done in most countries. I mean, the emphasis now is on targeting because we cannot afford universal systems. I disagree with this point, but uh, I wonder why uh, Nordic countries that are so influential in the international debate have uh, just been defeated on this point. That was two big questions. Uh, so we just agreed, Annika and I, that Annika takes the last one and I take the first one. Okay, first, why don't you, why yeah, don't you take the, it right away? Yeah, the first one, the question about the women. I think that even the, the former lawyer like me can uh, solve such kind of the simple mathematics. That if you, if you limit your resources, what you will have, only taking the half and not another half. So, um, and you know that they are equal smart. So we guess. So, of course, my possibility is to get the best resources. I have, I have minimized myself it with 50% compared to that that if I take the whole room and then try to, try to uh, find the best possible persons for different jobs. I normally say for the men who are worried about that, so don't worry, smart men will survive. <laughs> and uh, so far I have, uh, I have uh, managed with that. But of course then you will come also to another aspect than the gender. One is family, of course. Family background. The first wave of the general large education, of course, brings the most resources. Uh, but then if you don't look after the system all the time, you will face also the fact that whatever is the education system, <coughs> so those families where the parents have better education or they are more committed and so, so the children might, might uh, make better at school or at university because their parents encourage them and they say that, okay, you are fine boy, you will do that and so on. And then you don't say that, no, don't think so, that nobody has done it in our family. So I think that when we cannot choose, elect our parents, so the society has to be all the time little bit helping those who have, have not been so lucky. And, and so in that way I will say that um, the gender is important, but more and more we have to see also the boys now and say that boys are boys, but they live in modern society and they have also studied hard. That's it. Annika.
Annika, targeted Thank you. versus universal. <laughs> well, I think, I think we have to show the evidence more. I mean, of course, universal systems can be expensive if you start on a high level. But if you look at the, the Nordic examples, when, when, for example, social pensions were introduced, they were at a very low level. They were, they were paid at age 67 where li when life expectancy was 58. And then as, as you know, the country became richer in growth, you could expand these systems. Um, and and you, you do see social pensions uh, becoming more common. Um, I do think we have to, to uh, show the research, so show the results, and show the effects, and also show the link between the universal system and the, the, the resource mobilization, what it does for um, getting support for tax systems. So, so going back to the points that we heard this morning, looking at tax systems together with the expenditure side. Um, could I just also make one comment on the first question? And okay. I think uh, just in addition to what President Hallen was talking about. It would be about, interesting if you disagree with Tyler. No, no, not at all. No, not at all. I think we, we completely agree. We do it better. No, 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 not at all. I know I had a little bit of a different point, And I think also going back to the, to the Nordic example and going back to the role of employment and labor. Uh, Nordic policies have been very much uh, <coughs> enabling women to participate in the labor force by providing universal childcare, for example. Yeah, good, so, yeah. so, 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 you know, there is somebody who can take care of your children when you, when you go to work. Yeah. Uh, and, and that childcare has been, as, as we become richer, subsidized so everyone can afford it. So, so I know, I mean, it's it several policies that work together to enable women to participate. Yeah, education is always fine, but anybody from Jordan, <coughs> because the Jordan has the highest uh, uh, quota, very good quality of the education of the women in the Mediterranean, uh, let's say the South area. But the fact is that only 14% of those women will take part in labor force. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's nice that the women will get as a mothers and wives this kind of the education, but I think that they themselves and the society will lose something when they are not, um, when the circumstances have not made possible to them to, to go to work, as they, at least so they said to me when I have been a few times there. Sure. Joel, I'm, I'm going to come to you in just one second, because there was somebody here who was sitting waving with two hands. Joel, I will come back to you. Just one sec. Yes. Uh, Nora, I hope it's one sec. Nora Lustig from Tulane University. I uh, respectfully disagree. I don't think we can start with universal programs in very unequal societies, even if from the political economy it looks right. I think the principle of solidarity has to be there to make sure that the ones that are really at the bottom, I mean, I am from Latin America, and I can tell you that I have done studies comparing systems that are more universal with systems that are more targeted. For example, Bolivia, which has a much higher poverty rate than other countries, has universal systems of distributions because they decided when they privatized the mines to give everybody the same amount of money from there in their, in their pension system. But what that means is that you're not addressing the uh, poverty among the very poor. So I think that uh, the principle doesn't have to be that universally means that you have to give everybody the same amount. There has to be a principle of solidarity where in societies that are very, very unequal, you have to bring first people to a minimum level. That's what we need to agree upon. Because if you emphasize universality, you're going to constantly, in our countries, put a lot of money in the pockets of people that don't need it so much and not address those that are in dire need. We saw in Latin America what percentage of people of the distribution of the wealth are at the bottom in middle-income countries, okay? So I respectfully okay. disagree. I would love that model, but we're not there yet. Okay, thanks, Nora. Joel. Yeah, no, what I wanted to say does relate to, to, to this somewhat, but, but slightly different. I think arising from the inputs that have been made by the president and also from the floor is the question about the very definition of inequality. What are the measures that we use in the first instance, it would be income. Secondly, I think we also need to look at assets. And others would argue we also need to look at access to services and opportunity. 
um, and that there is a dynamic relationship amongst those various elements of inequality. With regard to, 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 to services, um, South Africa has done quite well, I, I would want to argue, uh, provision of uh, subsidized housing to the very poor. Uh, I think about 11 or so million people have been affected by that ho housing program. Uh, old age patient, child support grant, but they are somewhat targeted. You have to do an indigence measure to determine who deserve uh, these, these social grants. But what is it that we have learned between social services and work income? It is that if you provide people with subsidized or free services without providing employment, you might find that there is a negative outcome out of that. Let me just give an example from South Africa. We provide this subsidized housing to the very poor, but what you then discover is that among some of the poor who are engineers, they rent out those houses and go back to stay in the informal settlements in order to get some cash income because they are unemployed. So merely providing services without ensuring that you deal with the problem of unemployment might not have the, 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 the desired outcome. Inversely, if people are employed and you do not have proper services, the outcome will be they will be employed, they will get an income, but because water is poor, they will spend their, their wages paying for health services. So we have to deal with the problem in an integrated fashion. It's not just social services. It's not just uh, so, 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 so social grants. It should be social grants plus, all, plus uh, uh, economic opportunities. The two should go hand in hand. Yeah. James, you looked as if yeah, you... I just wanted to make a comment that you know, you're describing a scenario that justifies the whole approach of the multidimensional poverty measures that we've been seeing coming into the fore. And having people where you have multiple deprivations is it's impossible to move forward, even if you make some movement in one of them. You need to move them all or move a substantial portion of them. So to analyze where the problems are, a multidimensional approach, multidimensional poverty measure like the MPI, the UN, is, is quite helpful and it accurately depicts what you're talking about. Okay, Annika, you... Just a short comment to, to Nora's comment. Um, I mean, of course, the principle of solidarity is very important and that, that the social protection system help build social cohesion. Um, so, so in that sense, I, need to th I think you need to think about what should be universal. Um, and, you know, health care, um, help, you know, building... USA, very good case. <laughs> education, healthcare, build, building capacity, but also thinking about you know what what groups are at certain risk for being poor. And here I think you know children, old people. I mean those are groups where universal systems could work effectively. Then then the example of you know distributing mineral rents equal for all. You know I wouldn't argue for that. But I, I mean I think I think you have to think about what you want to achieve and, and, and who you want to who you want to reach. Yeah. Well, it, it is a little bit monotonous that we... We, we agree so much. Uh, we have differences, but we are like a sisters of the same family. So, so, I mean, outsiders think that we are safe. But, uh, but then coming to this, uh, this uh, what you said, of course, in all countries where you have universal system, you, you have also the certain limits you might have. You have also the certain, how could I say, um, uh, uh, um, stronger points where you give, but uh, normally these are just concerning if we take the incomes, of course, then we have unemployment, we have a sickness, you have uh, old age, then you might have also that uh, they want to support uh, uh, getting children and looking after the family and so on. And, and then you have services, and they are combined in very, very interesting way, because of course also there you have a political discussion that uh, is it possible that uh, the daycare <coughs> services are the same for the rich and poor in this country? Not. They, they, we pay more if you have more, more incomes. And, and then you, but then you come to this complicated situation where your own salary 
and, and the expenses you pay are not perhaps in quite fair, fair way to combine. So we have noticed that in that way the taxation many times is much, much easier. But, uh, but really, I think that especially health and education and such kind which are very important. And uh, for instance, the, in this country, I think that we have only two or three private schools and they are for the, re for the religious reasons. So we, everyone put children to the normal school and they make a success if they make a success. Thank you, thank you very much. Anybody else here more on this side? Please, no? Okay, uh, Andrea? Now, my, mine is a comment, Andrea Cornia, formerly wider, when uh, President Alonen Al was the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and now Florence, University of Florence. And I think that uh, I would like to be a little bit controversial as well. I think that, uh, uh, I mean, look at the impact of the Piketty's book. No, so inequality is right. Thomas Piketty wrote this book, uh, you know, Capitalism in the 21st Century, saying that inequality is rising everywhere. And this is certainly true in the West. You know, and basically the OECD data show that inequality is rising from low levels, but in practically every single European country, and certainly in the US, in Canada, and the Anglo world. Now, the second observation is that uh, the welfare system in, in the West are not entirely sustainable. And if you take the OECD data, they show that uh, they're, they're sort of the, the, I don't know how they call them, basically most pension system, they pay as you go system, they do tend to have a sort of outstanding liabilities which uh, would make them look uh, bankrupt, at least for the future. Now, um, now they take the European labor market. Well, Italy, Germany, France, uh, Spain, I mean, basically are, are more and more segmented. So basically, I don't know, in Germany, there are six million young people working with uh, part-time contracts or contracts without all the provision. In Italy, is, is the same or worse. In Spain, it's even bigger, the problem. So I, I would be <clears throat> quite careful in uh, suggesting to South Africa or the, the other countries to copy us. There are certainly many good things that uh, they can learn from us, but the world is different now. The world is different that we are in an open economy. We are losing a lot of jobs and a lot of employment because of competition from other countries. So I, I, would, I would say two things. One, I am happy to see that Joel says that uh, in a, the inequality decline is feasible because it has fallen in Latin America and some countries in Africa as well. Now, at the same time, in the north, inequality is rising. So just... Uh, why don't you develop your own pattern to development? Okay, thank nobody, you, Andrea. Nobody, yes, nobody uh, has asked you to, uh, they, to copy. They uh, asked that if they want to, um, rather to get a modification from the Nordic system than, the, for instance, American, German, Spain, Spanish, or Greek. Because, of course, we all learn from each other. And I think that what we could learn from each other is also <coughs> that we could perhaps think a little bit more happiness and not only unhappiness. I have been very interested that why Costa Rica and, and uh, Bhutan are more interested in the happiness index when we, I think, we would consider that the last thing we want to keep is that if we want to be unhappy, we are unhappy. But we want to, <laughs> we want to well, avoid the situations where the people normally become unhappy. That's all. <laughs> Okay, James? Yes, I want to clarify the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Index is in fact a flourishing index. You have all that you need to flourish. And it is built on the same multidimensional framework that we were talking about. Yeah. It's the same exact structure. I, I'm happy to go there in the next November. Please, let's go. <laughs> if I can make a small advertisement, the next wider working paper that will be published on Monday is a happiness paper. <clears throat> we are now going to go here. Yes, please. Thank you. Don't switch on. It should be on. My name is. No, it's not. Sorry, let's get another. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Hayford, and my 
question goes to James. You talked about issues of data and how we need to get a data and we've been talking about data, not just in this conference. Last year it came up, and uh, several other conferences we talk about data. And I'm sure we may meet sometime later in the future to look at inequality or other components that affect human welfare and development in general. Uh, we keep complaining or we have concerns with some data sets that we have been using globally, whether they are global and different measurements that take place, which makes it difficult to make comparisons across maybe countries or across regions. Uh, what can we do in terms of coming to a common measurement uh, uh, system where if I'm in Ghana and I am measuring inequality, uh, given the data set, I know exactly what I am picking as my data points, somebody in uh, Costa Rica is picking similar data points so that we can compare results across countries and regions. Thank you. Okay, James? Make a brief answer to that. Um, what can we do? Uh, right now is just the moment to raise ruckus and talk about exactly that issue because now is when post-2015 is upon us. And it won't happen unless we have a way of communicating across statistical offices, and everyone's talking with, I was just with Polly uh, the other day uh, from South Africa, statistics office. Uh, they have, people have to get together and talk about exactly that issue and put, uh, put the effort in right now at the UNGA and other uh, venues to make it happen. Now, you do with what you can at the moment, but that's where the action is going to take place, I think, is at this very moment to, uh, to motivate uh, uh, the decision makers. Okay, James? Any other one here? Yes, please. Okay, you know, thank you very uh, much. Uh, my name is Wisdom Akbalu, and uh, I work with the UNU Wider. Well, uh, I've listened to so many interesting presentations, and uh, I keep thinking, I think building strong institutions, especially in developing countries, precede most of the discussions that we've been having. Because uh, you need strong institutions to be able to mobilize resources if it is taxes, and you need strong institutions when you are disbursing these resources. So we have situations where you may have even well-targeted policies or earmarked uh, uh, I mean, uh, revenues, tax revenues to programs and projects, but because of leakages due to weaknesses in institutions, these uh, resources are not well mobilized or well utilized. They rather skew distributions even further. So uh, I, I'm a bit surprised that we haven't paid much attention to building institutions in this uh, conference. So if you have anything to say about that. <clears throat> yeah, sure. It will be in response to a number of issues that have been raised. Um, the first issue being about where can we learn from and what should we learn uh, in relation to the experiences of other countries. I would agree that there is a great deal from the Nordic experience that uh, all countries need, need to learn, given the low levels of inequality. In the context of uh, the, the, the South African policy-making processes, you would find formulations that talk about building a developmental state, but with the best attributes of social democracy so that you do not rely merely on the trickle down of high economic growth, but ensure that that growth benefits all. Uh, from Latin America, from the presentations that have been made, and, and, and particularly the Brazilian experience, I would argue that Bolche Familia, for instance, succeeded uh, amongst other things because it was combined with an industrial policy that would result in the expenditure from the poor being captured within the country itself. So if you are providing social grants, but then importing the things that the poor buy, then you will not be assisting your own industrial policy and, and employment. Then as I was saying from places like China, the question does arise. 
if China is climbing up the manufacturing sophistication ladder and many companies are shifting their enterprises to Vietnam and Bangladesh looking for cheap labor, should Africa spend that opportunity? Or should we encourage some of these enterprises to locate in Africa as a first phase, and then Africa in time will also climb up the manufacturing ladder? I think it's one of the issues that, 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 that would need a debate. Then there's the experience of Germany. High levels of, or low levels of unemployment, but informal work amongst the youth was the highest in, in, in Europe. Is there, is there a trade-off there that in order to get as many young people as employed, they had to do what they did, and now they are introducing a minimum wage? Or should you reject that approach altogether? So the point that I'm making is that there are many experiences from all over the world that need, need to be learned. And lastly, I would agree fully that uh, the issue of state efficiency, but I would also add state legitimacy is fundamental to the success of any program to, to deal with inequality. If the people do not have a sense that there is seriousness on the part of state leaders to deal with the challenges that society faces, if people do not have a sense that state resources will be handled in an ethical manner, if people do not have a sense that there is state efficiency, then there will be reluctance on the part of those people to pay higher taxes and to cooperate with the state. So institutional issues are fundamental to dealing not only with poverty but also inequality. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I continue like this. So I think that this is very, very important if people, because people want to live in somehow at least somehow fair society. And that means that um, they want to see what happens there where he or she is not by him or herself represented. And that's we come to the good governance and transparency. I always say when somebody asks that when we have been uh, among the last ones, very often the last one in the list of the corruption, that how is it possible? So, oh, no, we are not saints. We are not saints, but, but it's thanks for the transparency we get to know if somebody steals from the society. And I, I hate the whole word <coughs> corruption because it looks too fine. It smells too fine. It's stealing. And, and, and it's much better to say that person who takes such kind of the money is a thief. Sounds much better in such a way. And, and, and so I, I think that, that that's the way how we think. And, and so I say that there yeah, we get every now and then these persons who have done this. But, uh, but the, the question is, of course, that then you have to come also in a more complicated way that what are, the, for instance, the salaries of the civil servants? If you have so low uh, salary that you, you, you cannot live with that, then you, in a way, push people for the small way to, to take all money. Uh, but then there are, of course, always the persons who never have got enough. So, I mean, then you, pick, you speak about the big deal. And when you live in the European Union, so you get all the time also this different kind of the traditions. And, and that's why I say it's not only EU, it's the whole world, and then it's the regions, and then all that system. So it's very, very tough disease. But um, anyway, let's try. Annika, you indicated. Yeah, no, very short. I think it's already been said, but I absolutely agree that, that building institutions are, is, is fundamental and absolutely crucial. And, and, and here, going back to, to the original question you asked me, Finn, I think the donor community has a, an important role to pay to play to, to help build accounting offices, tax revenue authorities, and so on. Uh, and, and, and in the same way, the President Howland is saying that, you know, to, to create an atmosphere of good governance and transparency. Mm-hmm. Okay. That is, yes, please.
Um, hello, my name is Li Zheng. I'm from Beijing, China. I'm also, also a student from Laurel University of uh, Applied Sciences. And actually, uh, first, before I ask a question, I want to apply to, to a Chinese philosophy because, as uh, Joe also mentioned, there can be the vicious circle when you give always financial supports to the poor. There can be, they don't want to, they try to hide and in order to receive the financial offer. So actually, from our Chinese philosophy, we have conquered this problem by saying, show zhi yi yu, bu ru shou zhi yi yu. It sounds the same, but it's different. Yu. The first yu is the fish. The second yu is teach how to fish. So it means uh, by giving the fish to the poor, it's better to teach them how to fish. So and uh, my question actually is to President President Hallonen, because I live in Finland, I feel you have mentioned that taxation is very important here. And I also feel that taxation is a bit too much sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I, <laughs> my husband has worked really hard, but we are still living in the land because one third of his salary has gone to the, to the States. <laughs> so, <laughs> my question is, do you think taxation actually produce or increase the possibility for inequality. Because as Joe has mentioned, the definition of inequality is very important. And the three dimensions is assess income and assess two sources. But some people, they do not have the motivation to assess any kind of sources. So why people who work really hard and try to assess sources have to get money and their working fruits to those who do not even have motivation to do that? So thank you. So if I continue, yes, I think that you are becoming a good Finn, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way. Uh, so, but, uh, but then when you make a pause, you ask that whether you want to get a less, uh, whether you would like to get a reduction in taxation and uh, smaller benefits and services, or would you like to pay the taxation you have today and you will get the better services? People always take the services and, and, and the social welfare, the most of that. That has, that has uh, you can see, in, in most of the statistics. But that doesn't tell that, of course, in the taxation, you always have something to do, to prepare, to make it better. And uh, so that's why I say that, with my experience, is so that it's always easier to make clear a little bit progressive taxation and give the benefits as they are. If you try to combine them, so you get the situations where you pay both the taxation and you will pay the services, and, and then, then finally you count together that what's, what's worth of all this. Uh, so the situation have to be also, or the system have to be such kind that people themselves understand it. Um, I have seen through these years, the different kind of systems, how you can take away how much you have paid the medicine and this and that and that, which is, of course, the worst system because you do it afterwards and you need the money when, when this kind of situation comes. But this is an eternal issue. This is an eternal issue because it's not only the income policy. It's also the question that what is the property taxation, what, the, what is inheritance taxation, which kind of the... Um, uh, taxes you put in, the, in the, the things you consume and so on, and put all, all of that together. And um, I have not one, one truth on that, but I know that somehow we have to get also the uh, we, we have to get also the resources to cover the expenses. What we think that it's important with every generation to give some kind of the fair start, the fair start, because uh, it's not enough that you or even my eye that we have it, it has to be also to the new ones. One last question. I mean, maybe I can sort of say that it's sometimes difficult to sit still and be taught if you're hungry, but, ooh. Uh, somebody in the back? Okay, let's take all in the back. You're getting the last one. No, no, the, down here on the floor. <coughs> Yeah, that's... <laughs> Thank you. My name is Vasco from Mozambique. Um, what um, I'm worried about is that uh, uh, 
uh, inequality, addressing inequality is all about uh, creating jobs for the poor. But uh, the question I would like to raise here is related to um, how donors um, have been working with the, the poor countries to help them to create jobs for um, uh, lifting the poor from this, the state that they are. The current system of donor is, uh, is not helpful because most of the donors that are tied do, uh, uh, donations with um, uh, obligation for the uh, um, uh, with obligation for the country sometimes to buy things from the, 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 the home country. How can we now transform this system um, in order to build in jobs in the, uh, in the receiving countries? Transforming the, 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 the uh, transport, transforming the, um, let's say, um, the production in the home donors' countries to the receiving countries. I can say, for example, donors for, uh, donation from China, from Sweden, from wherever. Most of them are uh, tied to donations. And how can we transform this uh, into the job creation to the receiving countries? Thank you. Thank you very much, Vasco. Somebody want to comment? Annika? Should I, should I mean, I Maybe I can just sort of <laughs> supplement the question by saying that the reason why the position paper on aid, growth, and employment does point to a rather spotty approach and sometimes sort of disperse too much with too many small, teeny initiatives in the job that there is something more that is required? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, the donor agencies don't create jobs. It's, it's, it's people and firms in the country that create jobs. Uh, what, what, what donor agencies can do is to work together with companies, domestic and international, to provide uh, or to um, promote decent work and good working conditions and uh, help establish firms. But I, you know, Swedish aid is not tied to, to, um, to, to Sweden that you have to buy uh, things from Swedish companies. Um, companies operate, they have their models and their business models and they should operate that way and, and donors should operate to, to, we work to eradicate poverty, that's our goal. Uh, so everything that, that donors do sh should, should go to, towards that aim. Um, but, I, but I agree with Finn also, we, we need to do more and we need to find other um, engage other actors in, in doing this together, I think. Thank you, Annika. If I say very briefly that um, we, in this country, we <coughs> had earlier the idea that it's somehow dirty to try to, to have a trade with those countries who we have a development cooperation relationship. But then we, we, we noticed that the countries themselves, like Mozambique, they said that find that you give this development cooperation, but it would be much better if any of your enterprises could come and establish their activities in our country that we could get a job and we could get our own system with that. And, and so we tried to combine it, but it comes very clear uh, near also the, the risk, the difficulty that it goes straight first and then the support. And I think this is really the issue, what you should study, in which way you like it. Um, and, and what I would once again underline, that your own regional cooperation sometimes could be a helpful, because then you could avoid uh, this, how could I say, dumping, uh, dumping by, uh, made by investors, so that if you all say in the same way, so they don't find the place where it should be extremely uh, much less expensive because uh, I mean the circumstances where the developing countries have to try to come from the worst to the next step sometimes it's very cruel. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel. Thank you very much the four of you and then if, if you don't mind just being patient for just one or two minutes when I close overall but can we in the meantime give the panel a big hand of applause. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
We've come to the end of two really busy days, and I'd like to begin by expressing my thanks to all of you from all around the world for your many contributions to this development conference on inequality and its different dimensions. I'd like to repeat or reiterate that I thanked Minister Neri on his way out. It was really great to hear about the Brazilian experience, but I'd also like to thank you very much, our closing panel, Preston Hallinan, Joel, Anita, and James. Thank you. Thank you very much. But we have also had presenters, we've had session chairs, we've had invited experts, and I, for one at least, have to say that I picked up a lot of things around the way, and for that, I would say thank you. I would also like to say thank you very much to the members of the UNU wider team for putting together one of the largest conferences in the history uh, of UNU wider. I'd like to especially thank the conference team. Mina, where are you? Dennis. Anna Tuli. Anna Tuli, where are you? <clears throat> Kennedy. Brooke. Labour. Anu, Annette, and James, you made sure that the loud speaking things worked. <laughs> Maria and Miriam as well for the administrative and accounting information. Yuka, you have served as an effective ac academic focal point together with Tony and I myself. Where are you, Yuka? You should get up. <laughs> so, members of the whole wider team, you have worked hard for the past few months. I am very grateful for everyone's contribution, and I hope that all the participants will join me in applauding you. Thank you. <laughs> now last, but maybe not least while I speak, all participants will have received an email from Union Wider in which we ask for your feedback for this conference. We would be most grateful if you would kindly take a moment to fill it in. It is important for us both to get feedback, and I hope that you will take my aside comment in my opening remarks where I said that this is indeed one of the monitoring indicators of our donors. So please do fill it in and send it back to us. But finally, I wish you all a safe travel back home do follow us on www.wider.unu.edu, and we look forward to seeing you next time for an engaging encounter. Thank you very much for, to everybody, and safe travel home.